So thanks everyone for attending here. Uh, very happy and to be here. Uh, well, we actually already got a great introduction. Uh, so my name is Fenno. I'm a, a data engineer at Eneco. So Eneco is one of the largest uh, energy suppliers in the Netherlands. And uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, specifically estimating uh, solar panel production. So I'll let my colleague introduce himself. My name is Rick. Uh, I work as a data scientist for a couple of years now at uh, Eneco. I have a background in electro engineering. Um, then grew a little bit into signal processing and eventually data science. And I, for me, Enigo is the perfect place because I have some electricity, which is close to my heart, but also some data science. Uh, and actually, today's use case will also be about electricity and data science. So we're going to st start with a little bit of a primer about electricity data. Maybe not all of you are familiar. But um, question, who of you has solar panels on their home? Ah, that's a good amount. OK, that's exciting. So if you have solar panels, all you really care about is production. How much do my solar panels produce, right? Um, and if your solar panels produce energy, there's two things that can happen. Either it goes directly to whatever you consume, like your washing machine, your toaster, your TV, whatever is running at that moment in your house, or if there's an access, it gets re-delivered to the grid. This is what we call re-delivery. In the night, you don't have solar production. You get some delivery from the grid, and that goes to consumption. So consumption can come either from production or from the grid. And your production can go either back into the grid or directly be consumed inside of the house. Um, as you might have spotted, there is some green and some red variables in this picture, right? So. Radiation, delivery, re-delivery are things that you can measure with your smart meter. Well, not radiation, but we can get that from the KNMI. So. Um, deliver, uh, delivery and re-delivery is what goes in and out of your house, and that's what we get from the smart meter. But as a consumer, you're maybe more interested in what is my production, what is my consumption. So that's the use case we're going to talk about today. If we get the data from your smart meter, Redelivery and delivery. Can we estimate how much your solar panels actually were producing at that day and how much your self consumption was? So, this is a screenshot uh, in the right you see from the Eneco app. Um, and in the yellow, you see your redelivery. So, this is what you have been feeding back into the grid. Actually, this is a screenshot from my own house. Um, I don't have a lot of solar panels, so I have, don't have like a super huge redelivery. But uh, at the peak, it's like almost 700 watts of redelivery. And then you see um, the green bars, and they're a little bit higher. So they are maybe like 800, 900. That is the estimated production of more solar panels. So the difference between the green and the yellow bars is what I was consuming myself, right? So I produce 900, I use 200, I redeliver 700. Um, this yellow stuff is actual measured data. The green stuff is stuff that was predicted by a model, and that's the model we're going to talk about today. So this is the use, use case for estimated production. Estimated consumption, you can also derive that. If you know one, you know the other. We also use that for some of the energy inside features that are in the Eneco Smart Meter app, but that's a topic for another day. Good. That's the data. That's the use case. But how do you get smart meter data from your house mm -hmm to an app. That's yeah. what uh, Fenno will talk about right now. Yeah, let's talk about the, uh, the sort of energy data uh, landscape here. So uh, your data starts off being produced by a smart meter that most people have in their house uh, that measures your, uh, yeah, your delivery and redelivery. Uh, but this smart meter is actually operated um, not by an echo. Uh, an echo is like the supplier. Uh, but uh, actually, smart meters are operated by the grid operators. Uh, or in Dutch, they're called netbeheerders. Uh, these grid operators are responsible for um, maintaining the physical infrastructure of, your, uh, uh, of the electricity network, making sure that it actually keeps working. Uh, so these grid operators, they also collect the smart meter data um, and, of course, use it to calculate your bill uh, at the end of the year. Um, but there's also sort of this collective of grid operators that's called Energy Data Services Netherlands. 
And uh, they also collect all this smart meter data uh, for potentially to be used for other purposes, like what we want to use it for. Uh, so there are some like GDPR, some uh, privacy um, uh, consequences there. So if you want to use that data for other purposes, then just calculating your bill. You actually need permission also from the customer. So we have to uh, expressly ask a customer for permission, like, are you okay that we, we uh, use that data uh, for other purposes? Uh, in that case, yeah. Uh, that's what Energy Data Services Netherlands also does, is they make sure of that. Uh, once we have that sort of check from the customer, uh, they will start sending that data to us. So in, in this case, uh, we have this Kafka, which is like this messaging streaming platform that we use to, uh, to make sure all this data uh, is available to us. Uh, from Kafka, it then enters our sort of machine learning slash data science environment, um, which in our case is um, based on Databricks. Um, in Databricks, we make a prediction. We predict your, your solar usage. Uh, from there on, it um, will make its way eventually back to the mobile app. Um, so it's kind of from that moment on, it's sort of hands off for us. Uh, and uh, we let all the, the front end uh, mobile app developers uh, take it from there. Um, so for the rest of the slides, we're going to focus on, uh, on this data science environment. So you continue. Thanks. So let's dive a little bit deeper and look into our data science flow. Basically, what we depicted here is how we do predictions and how we do training of the model. So on the top, you see your day-to-day -day prediction flow. So every day data comes in, we need to make a prediction of solar prediction in this case, but also there's many other use cases. Um, so you have your incoming data, then there's some pre-processing steps, and then you have the distributed predictions. We'll get into that later. Um, but for now, let's focus first on the, on the bottom half. So with the historical data, you can train a model. Um, and finally, we put that model in some place that can also be used um, mm -hmm. later on in the predictions. This seems a little bit trivial now, but it's important to have this flow in your mind when we dive into each of the subtopics. So, Let's talk about the bottom flow, the experimentation, the making a model um, and getting it to run. So the input data, this is basically a summary of what you already saw also on the very first slide. The input data that we have is delivery data, re-delivery data, and global radiation data. Those are the three green things you saw on the first slide. They are each 96 data points because we get them at 15 minutes intervals and there's 15 there's 96 15-minute intervals in one day. And we do a prediction on a day-by-day -day basis. Then the output, what we want to get, that's basically the green bar that you saw in the first picture, is for the full day, how much did it produce for every 15-minute interval. Finally, we have our input and our output data, but we need some label data, right? Every machine learning starts with what labels can I get, what quality data can I get? Um, the good thing is that Eneco also offers a smart thermostat, uh, which also delivers energy inside. So it's also connected to your electricity and gas meter inside of the house. And this one can get real-time insights in a lot better resolution than we can get the long route Fano explains from the smart meters, grid operators, all that kind of stuff. Um, and with Tone also comes a module that will actually measure what are your solar panels producing and what is a household consuming. So, Basically, there we have all the, also all the red parts. So we can use that data, resample it to the same 15-minute interval, and then we have our training data. Good. Now, Fenno will uh, explain yeah. it. This one's on you, right? This is my side. OK, yeah. sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, That's fine. Good. If we think about training the model, yeah. we need to think about the model. And this is the model that we eventually settled on. We, um, we began with a lot more complex architecture, but then figured maybe you can simpl simplify it, <laughs> make it a little bit sparser. So if you're familiar with neural network and you have done some image recognition, actually this is pretty similar. So what usually what you have, we start with our three times 96 inputs, which I explained on the previous slide, and then we have a convolution step. And the convolution step is there to recognize patterns, maybe like the sun going up or the sun going down, um, just to see that tempor uh, temporal correlation in the data. Then we flatten everything, 
and then there's a layer of fully connected steps. Um, in the end, that's where the model really, you hopefully learns all the stuff that you wanted to learn. And then finally, we also have a convolution step in the output to again kind of like scale up the model, have a time series output, and also make sure that the output is a little bit self-correlated as well. So you get a nice smooth output um, in your curve. Yeah. Good. So uh, that architecture, uh, yeah, it works quite well. Uh, but we ran into sort of, well, let's say this, this classic kind of deep learning uh, problem is that it just takes a while. And in our case, the issue especially is we have uh, a lot of data. Um, we have a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of fine, uh, fine grained data over a long period of time from a lot of customers. And we kind of want to use all of this data, of course, because that's a really uh, nice problem to have. Uh, but it just takes a while to train the model. So um, um, the obvious, like an answer, this also means that the iterating uh, becomes a bit slower, right? You want to try some, some hyperparameter tuning and try some stuff out, maybe remove a layer or uh, add a layer or something. But uh, you have to wait a few hours. So that's kind of uh, unfortunate. So um, the, uh, we could try experimenting with less data, of course, uh, but that's also a bit unsatisfying. Uh, so of course, we start thinking, OK, can we just use multiple GPUs, right? We have this sort of cloud environment. We can rent uh, GPUs from, from the cloud. So uh, let's just throw more power at the problem. Uh, and that leads into this, uh, into this concept called uh, distributed deep learning that I want to spend like a quick minute introducing. Like, um, what do I mean with distributed deep learning? Because it's, I would say it's quite a relevant sort of uh, topic these days, right? Like our model is sort of relatively small, I would say, in the grand scheme of things compared to like some tech giants out there. Uh, but there are, uh, in general, there's a large need to have, um, to be able to use more GPUs, to be able to um, um, speed up machine learning, uh, deep learning like training. So there's kind of two main methods, I would say, of distributed, de uh, distributed deep learning. So how are you going to split up the problem across multiple GPUs? Um, one of those is what's called um, model um, parallelism. So that's where you want to split up your model across different GPUs. So if you have, let's say you have a model with 10 layers, well, one way to split up that model would be to have, for example, five GPUs, and then each GPU uh, is going to uh, have contain two, uh, the parameters of two layers. And that it works really well for very large models. If you have huge models with billions of parameters, uh, that's, I mean, it almost becomes necessary, right? Because, one, uh, because the entire model wouldn't even fit on a single GPU. Um, so that's, that model parallelism is also what's, what's used by, you hear these models in the news about GPT-3 with hundreds of billions of parameters. That's what they use. Uh, but we actually kind of have a little bit of an opposite problem. We don't have a very large model uh, when you just look at the number of parameters, uh, but we have a lot of data. So we actually kind of want to use maybe a bit more of a simpler parallelism method uh, where we just have the model on a single GPU, but we want to just process the data faster. So that's where, um, that's where the second sort of way of distributed learning comes in. That's called data parallelism. Um, so our solution is to use this, um, to use this open source Python package. It's called Horovod. Uh, it was uh, developed by Uber. Um, and uh, this is sort of a Python package that makes it possible for you to do data parallelism in, I would say, quite a straightforward way. Um, so the way that works is, let's say you are going to train an epoch of your, your, um, your model. Well, instead of just taking one uh, batch of data and giving it to your GPU, it essentially takes four batches of data at the same time. So it will take four batches of data, or, well, four is a variable, right? You could use eight or 16. So um, if you use eight GPUs, it will take eight batches of data, distribute it out to your eight GPUs, and then they all do like an epoch uh, at the same time. And then at the end of that epoch, you are going to like sum all the gradients together. So effectively what you are doing is you're kind of increasing your batch size. Uh, if you normally use a batch size of 128, well, if you have eight GPUs and you give each of those eight GPUs uh, the same batch, then you are, um, your batch size effectively becomes 1024. And what that also means, um, I'm not going to go too deep into the math here, but if you uh, increase your batch size in general, that means you can also uh, increase your learning rate. 
So um, if you want the same convergence properties on your model and you increase the batch size by a certain amount, you can also increase the learning rate by that same amount. So, um, and of course, if you increase the learning rate by a lot, that usually means your model is going to converge uh, a bit quick, uh, quite a bit quicker as well. So this ends up working really nicely and speeding it up uh, quite a lot. Um, so one sort of characteristic about Horovod is um, this sort of what's called ring formation. So this is an interesting problem is how do you actually share these gradients? Uh, sort of a classical, maybe old school solution to this would be to have some kind of parameter server, to have some kind of central server that sh uh, stores all the parameters, all the gradients for all the, for all the individual um, um, nodes and then shares them around. But that kind of adds a lot of overhead. So this is sort of the characteristic way that Horovod uh, does things is it uses this kind of ring formation where, uh, where every sort of node only needs to communicate with one other node. And that actually causes it to, well, basically make the epochs almost exactly the same time than they would have, except you now process double the batch size or quadruple or octuple, depending on however many GPUs you want to use. So um, I want to give uh, a code sample because uh, for those of you that may be interested, uh, uh, I think it's good to give an example of how does this actually work. So here's sort of a, I would say, fairly minimal example of this is actually basically taken also from our code, except I removed some, a lot of unnecessary details. Uh, so on the first line, we have this, uh, oh, I would say standard PyTorch uh, optimizer. Um, the model is not defined here, but trust me, there's a model behind there. Uh, and um, uh, another note is Horvath does also work with TensorFlow and Keras. Um, but in the, our case, we use uh, PyTorch. And the only change we make to the regular like PyTorch model is we change the learning rate here. So you can see we, we multiply this learning rate with horovod.size. And horovod.size, that's a parameter that, that um, contains like the number of nodes. Uh, and like I just explained, um, because we are using a much bigger batch size, it's also is a good idea to also basically increase our learning rate accordingly. Then the second step here is to create this Horvath optimizer. And it's almost, I, uh, I don't want to exaggerate, but it's almost kind of like magic in the sense that it's, uh, it will do a lot of stuff like behind the scenes and uh, distribute all the job, do all the gr uh, gradient summing all behind the scenes. And it kind of just works. Um, there's one more thing you need to do. Uh, if you think about it, uh, about the like, initialization of the, of the models, right? If you have eight GPUs and you want to um, initialize the model, you need to make sure they're all initialized with the exact same random state. Because if they have a different random state, then the gradients are going to be incomparable. You, you are not going to be able to, to, um, to add the gradients together. So we need to have this like, sort of what's called here broadcast parameter step where we uh, are going to like, make sure they all have the same initial random state. And then after that, there is a um, yeah, sort of standard PyTorch training loop here. Uh, it's a bit simplified, but you can sort of see it's a um, straightforward kind of PyTorch training loop. The only change here is that we replaced like the PyTorch optimizer with the like Horovod optimizer object. Uh, but otherwise, es essentially, uh, if you sort of um, have a little bit of time, you can sort of, without too much effort, adapt an existing like deep learning method uh, model into a uh, into a Horovod model. The most difficult thing I would say is actually finding a computer with like four or eight GPUs. That's quite difficult these days. Um, so now we have our model, and I think I'm going to you know, hand it over and uh, see what we do then after we have trained our model. Yes, thanks. So if you think back to the experimentation flow, now we showed you what our model is like, how we train it, but as with all data scientists, there's a lot of bookkeeping to do, right? You want to experiment, you want to try a different layer, adding it, trying some hyperparameter tuning. Of course, we also tried some other models. Um, and that's why I want to explain a little bit about the MLflow setup. MLflow is an open source package, basically for keeping track of all machine, le le machine learning related tech. Um, and basically, we use it for three things. First of all, as I just explained, you just want to do a different experiment. Um, and if you do this in a notebook environment, it's able to kind of like track everything that you do, but also keep a version history using Git under the hood of what your notebook was like at that time. So you can go back at any time. Um, there's also an element of 
actually preserving the model that you have trained using a pickle. Um, so you take the model, you also log this as an, as an artifact, and you can retrieve it then later to also run that model again. Um, actually, with the pickling, we ran into some other issues as well, and that's what our talk uh, this afternoon together with Corne will be about. Uh, so if you want to learn more about pickling, stay tuned for the, that part. And finally, there's also a part where you can select which model you want to have live. So this is a very minimal code example, but just to show that it's relatively low effort to put it in your code loop. So in Python, you just get your training data, and in the end, you have your train KRS model. And in Python, you have this nice width block, which makes a context. You also use it if you open a file, and it basically it starts something, then you do your code, and then it stops something again. So this keeps track of, it makes a new run, and then now we're using the auto logger, but you can log any parameters and metrics that you want, which is a bit of uh, an upside and a downside, because you can do everything you like, but then you also need to do it yourself. So this is what some of the different runs look like, right? It looks a little bit messy, but that is typically what machine learning is like, in my view, right? Even if you work structured, sometimes it fails, sometimes you try some different runs, and that's something you see in the, like, the red and green things, like some of them uh, failed and some of them were successful, but we also keep track of some of the parameters, like our loss or like how complex was the model, and in the end, we can use this overview to see, okay, which model has the best trade-off between uh, test performance and how complex the model it was or how long it took to train. Um, and then finally, you can put this uh, model into production, which is basically you just take one of the entries that you saw from the previous slide and you just apply a tag, say, hey, this is now production. So then if you go back to your flow, this is the final part, like the model registry. Um, and then if you do your predictions, you can say, hey, I want a model that has tag production. Uh, can you please give it to me? And then it can be used um, for the prediction in that flow. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, can you go back? <laughs> yes, for the, sorry. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, basically you see here the, the bottom uh, sort of pipeline um, uses, well, it doesn't use much like Spark or any Spark um, because, well, we kind of uh, uh, want to train on like one instance with a lot of GPUs mostly. Uh, training a deep learning model is actually like, can be a little bit difficult to parallelize because if you think about it, training a deep learning model is like incredibly sort of, uh, all these parameters are like dependent on each other, right? We want to share all these gradients around uh, and all these parameters are dependent on each other. So it's actually a little bit difficult to, to really parallelize uh, a deep learning model it like very easily um, but uh, when we when it comes to prediction it actually sort of becomes well a lot easier uh, because predictions can be made essentially independently of each other we have our model that saves an ml flow uh, we can then make predictions on essentially as many instances as we want at the same time uh, so that's where we can sort of easily bring in a uh, spark um, so yeah can you uh continue, so uh, there's a few sort of considerations to be made there. One is sort of cost, uh, right? We, training our model is kind of done on GPU. Uh, we don't really have uh, uh, a choice there because training a model on a CPU is not really uh, feasible. But actually uh, predicting is kind of fine, right? It takes a little bit longer on, on CPU, but it's, it's not that bad. Uh, so, uh, and, we s and of course, we can save quite a bit of money because GPUs are uh, a bit expensive these days. Um, so we, we change our prediction to CPU instead. Uh, however, we still have sort of an issue with, uh, with prediction sort of volume. So uh, we have a lot of predictions to be made. Uh, every day we sort of make the prediction for like the last day. Uh, so uh, like I explained, uh, the way to parallelize this is sort of by splitting it up. Uh, um, using Spark, we can use, for instance, 16 workers uh, to do prediction uh, 16 times at the same time. And I think the reason why we use 16 is because it's a nice sort of power of two. So it's an aesthetically nice number. Uh, so that's, that's that part of the puzzle. Uh, yeah, and then so, uh, so like I explained, I think the very beginning, once those predictions are made, they're then sent off, they're sort of out of our hands, uh, sent off to like the mobile uh, app development team, and uh, they end up 
sort of back in the like the mine, uh, mine and Eco app. So uh, yeah, I would say <laughs> to anyone here that's uh, an Eco customer, I saw a lot of people had solar panels. So uh, I would say give uh, give permission. Uh, that's great because you get some insights and also we get more data uh, to work with as well. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and then you can uh, see these kinds of uh, screenshots as well. Uh, yes. Um, I want to also to end the presentation with thanking all of our team members. Of course, we are presenting this. We are uh, shining uh, with the use case, but I'm not a mobile app developer. Uh, and also, there's a lot of data science, data engineer, software engineering work that uh, went into this. So uh, yes, thanks to everybody that made it work. And uh, I think this was the end of our presentation. Yeah. Thank you, and uh, questions. So I'm going to start from here. Um, yeah, my question would be like uh, regarding the architecture that you have. So since you are mostly working with, let's say, time series kind of data, why didn't you consider some LSTM best architecture for your model training or conf LSTM kind? Um, Good question. I don't know. I, th um, I think we. I think we did at some point. There try is a it. lot of experimentation that yeah. in went to it, into this, also by other people than us. But mm -hmm. maybe if anyone wants to say. Well, I, th I, th I think uh, that has been tried, but it's it's uh, it's the kind of thing you know. Uh, experimentation <laughs> can be a bit messy, so uh, I don't know exactly how those experiments went, but I think it's just sort of uh, what ended up working uh, the best for us was this sort of I would say relatively sort of simple kind of model. Uh, Ended up just be giving a better performance than uh, than like a more complex kind of LSTM model. Yeah, LSTM can be simple as well and based on the kind of architecture that. You, uh, second question would be like, you told uh, uh, using this parallel architecture, you managed to train faster because you had like much higher learning rate mm -hmm. and it converts faster. So, did you had any issue, any issue with like sub optimal solution or? Because it converts too fast, maybe it didn't reach the optimal solution, and how did you tackle that problem? Like, is it like it could be theoretically possible that it yeah. converges slower because of you have, or that it doesn't converge as well because of the higher learning rate? You mean, or yeah, exactly. It uh, might not be optimal as well, right? It stuck into a local minima. Uh, yeah, I think that's that's probably possible, but uh, I. Don't think that's uh, the problem we had. Like we also had a lot of data to work with, so uh, uh, yeah, that's not something that we ran into. So you didn't have any issue with overfitting or anything else? Hmm. Well, I'm not sure if we overfitted in general, but uh, uh, well. Uh, that's fine. <laughs> wow, Hey, thank you for your uh, great talk. I had a lot of fun uh, watching. Um, I, I use myself the, the, the built-in uh, parallelism engine in TensorFlow, so why not use that one instead? I think the, we use Spark for a lot of area experimentation and also for loading in the data. Um, Harvard also has the option to use Spark for parallelism. And, and we didn't end uh, up using that. Um, but for us, that was a nice thing to try out so that we also had the potential oh. to use Spark there. And also, our model was trained on PyTorch. I'm, actually, I'm not sure if PyTorch has also, probably also has parallelism methods, but uh, mm. that's a quick comment about that. Yeah, no, and I, I, I like it anyway because I, I didn't know about the library, now I do, so thank you. Uh, so you mentioned a little bit about the use case, um, but I, I don't get it yet. Like, w what value does it have to an echo to un to be able to predict this? Wh why not just predict the, uh, the the stuff that is the teruglevering? Uh, so y you're asking what is the value in seeing the produced solar electricity? Yeah. I think it's not necessarily value to an echo, but value to the end customers. I think a lot of people want to see. How much, how well their solar panels are performing, right? If you have mm -hmm. like a 1,200 watt peak installation, 
and then it's a sunny day, you want to see, did I make my 1200 watt peak? But if you were consuming 400 watts, you only see 800 watts of redelivery. Uh. So there, there's a bit of a blind spot in what is your self-consumption and what do you redeliver back to the grid? So to get insight in what you're really using, that's why we estimate the produced solar power. But you could prevent the whole thing by, by just having some piece of hardware that registers the, the, the production, right? Yes, yes. So for the smart thermostat, we have a piece of hardware that registers that, but you need to go into your metering cabinet, then take out some wires and put in uh, this module back. Mm. The nice thing about the Eneco app is that it's using smart metering data, which already gets sent to the grid operator. So all you have to do is install the app, give permission, yeah. and be an Eneco customer, of course, but it's like completely hardware free in that we're using a hardware that already exists. Cool, thanks. Yeah, that clarifies it. Um, maybe in, instead of the, the hardware solution, did you consider just asking the users how many solar panels do you have? And maybe if you know what's the, the peak production that they achieve and, and include that information in your prediction. In, in training. Mm -hmm. So the question is, can we ask users how many solar panels do you have to enhance this prediction? Yeah, it seems like relevant information. And if you can just get it from the customer who's interested in this, it makes it a lot simpler. Mm -hmm. um, for this particular use case, I don't think it is asked. It will be asked now in the Smart Thermostat app. Um, it's an interesting point. I don't think we do it yet. Um, I do think the model should be able to get most of it because it, if you kind of like have a baseline electricity consumption, on a sunny day, you're supposed to come close to your max. And then maybe once in a day, you get close to like your really power. And if you have something that's always on, you should always also be able to see that during the night, like what is your base mm -hmm. load consumption. But I think yeah. it's a good question. It would help if you ask yeah. how many uh, solar panels are there. And I think that's, that's maybe one of the tricky parts. Also now, of course, we have one model that will predict for all the users. And of course, it has seen a lot of users, so it can generalize also a little bit. Um, but every household can also have its particular things, right? There might be a household that has a tree, and then in the morning, it do doesn't have any prediction because there's shade on the house. So um, I think there's more specialization uh, things that we could do to make it better for individual households as well. Thank you. Thanks. Great talk. Thank you very much. Um, just a simple question. What is the next thing you guys are going to do now that you've cracked this? Mm -hmm. um, well, one other thing, uh, one other thing that we are, one other use case that's already out there, but I think it's also interesting to mention, we also have a service where from the electricity signals, you can detect which appliances are running. If you see like a bump, that might be a washing machine or a dryer. And in the night, you can see the fridge turn on and on. So we also have a service that breaks it down, uh, electricity. And actually, that bill breakdown, electricity bill breakdown, was also a reason to make this. Because now we can also use the true consumption for that. Um, one other thing that we are keen on is um, having something that's more involved also with the user. So can we set some goals? Like uh, how much would you like to save? Or you're doing like this, but you want to go there. Can we help you with that? Or give some smart tips. So I think this is a great insight for the user, but we're also thinking about how can we make it more interactive and really uh, stimulate people to go green, so to say. Yeah, cool. This is like the previous question then, right? Like, what's the usefulness of having this? So you want to enable your users to do more or less or have more insights. No, thank you. I don't want to drop that much. Hi. Um, awesome model. Definitely great work. So my, my question is similar to his question about the business case on this. I mean, GPUs are expensive. You guys are probably burning through maybe like 100K a month or something uh, if you retrain a model. Um, at least this is what we, we're doing. Um, how do you justify this to the penny-pinching managers who are saying, okay, but how does this add value to my company? So it definitely adds value to your customers. Yes. But how does it add value to the company because they're paying the bill for the GPU? Yes. 
That's a good question. And I think that's always an ongoing uh, discussion because I think part of the values I think in uh, building a bis better relation with your customer, right? If you have this great insight, you're not gonna, maybe not gonna change to uh, customers, a different energy supplier next year. So that's part of it. But we also find that it's very hard to quantify. Um, and I think another thing could be that you can make smarter suggestions for improvements to your house. If we, uh, so this is the case for people with solar panels, but for people that don't have solar panels, there's also a similar kind of simulation that says, hey, you don't have solar panels, but you could make this much if you would have solar panels. So okay. uh, that's Have you similar. thought about offering this service to your energy futures traders that say, okay, on mm. aggregate, we're probably gonna have to produce more energy because the weather forecast for the next two days is uh, low, energy, low solar panels, so we're gonna have to buy more energy from the grid because that's like a direct benefit from the business case from having a solar prediction model. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about more future pr predictions and like grid balancing yeah. uh, this kind yeah, of thing? Yeah, interest trading. I think trading. We, we basically, we kind of already do that. We, we already share some sort of, but especially on the usage side, on like how much customer, how much electricity users uh, use, that's a very interesting information for futures, I agree. So we, we actually already do some of that. Not as much as we would like, but some of that already, yeah.